Hey, Jamie, welcome to the Gut Glow Reset Program. I'm so excited to have you here this week, getting started in this four-month journey together. So I just want to review the welcome packet for you. So you have a bunch of clarity on all the clinical assessment, the recommended plan, so you feel confident moving forward. So let's dive into it. I will share my screen with you. So you said you had reviewed this a little bit, so that's awesome. So I won't really get too into the details of healthy. Definitely watch the welcome video. I definitely recommend um, joining the Q&A sessions twice a month live. I will be posting the link in the Facebook group every month. So definitely recommend attending that. And you can get live coaching. You can hear from others who are going through similar struggles. We'll celebrate wins. We'll just discuss questions. We'll discuss holidays coming up. So definitely recommend that. We're actually going to have the first one next Wednesday at 5 p.m. So I'll be reminding you guys about that in the Facebook group. So if you haven't joined yet, join through the roadmap in your, um, your join through the, the Facebook group in the roadmap that I sent you via Google Drive. And after the one-to-one -one week, we will be then checking in bi-monthly with the healthy accountability form. So you'll be getting emails from healthy that say complete new module. Um, so you click that, you open it up and you complete the bi-monthly check-in. And then I'll contact you via messenger and we will fine tune your progress. We'll discuss any questions you have. We'll set new goals. We'll discuss new avenues to explore, to promote healing. So we'll be constantly keeping in touch throughout the program. And in between, you can always ask questions via Facebook or in your notes section as in your healthy journal. If you don't want to share something private, like publicly in the group, you can always post a private note. So the more that you post, the better, right? So food, drinks, snacks, approximate portion sizes, Photos are always really great because that helps me get a good visual of the meal. And I definitely recommend any symptoms, you know, posting symptoms that you have, any constipation, extra bloating, reflux, nausea, anything like that as, you know, part of your journal so we can kind of troubleshoot what happened and how we can prevent it going forward. So the health vision form, this is actually going to be requested and healthy in about a week from now. So check out, you know, keep a lookout for that in your emails. So we'll be kind of going over these questions as you're doing your offboarding next week. And I just wanted to dive into it with, we are what our gut bacteria eats. Oh, doesn't like me right now. Okay. <laughs> so you are what your gut bacteria eat. So what we feed our gut is providing it information, right? So we provide fiber, we provide different fats. We provide carbohydrates. So all the food that we eat is either promoting inflammation and disease or either promoting health. And there's a very wide spectrum of this. There's not really good or bad foods, right? Like we don't want to label things as good or bad, but there are foods that better feed our good gut bacteria, like prebiotics and probiotics, food with live cultures, fibers from veggies, fruits and nuts and seeds, polyphenols, resistant starch, fermented foods, herbs, spices, anti-inflammatory seasonings. So all these things increase our good bacteria and promote our bacteria to pr promote basically and produce beneficial metabolites like short chain fatty acids and reduce inflam inflammatory products such as LPS, which is lipopolysaccharides. These are kind of things that produce by pathogenic bacteria. So when we eat these positive foods, these foods that promote good gut bacterial growth and replication and producing those beneficial metabolites, we have less of a chance of chronic risks of disease and, you know, high inflammation in the body reduces the risk of TMAO production, which is from too much conventional red meat. Um, increased cardiovascular disease, cognitive decline, gut inflammation, diarrhea and constipation. So altered bowels and insulin resistance. So our good bacteria, when we have more of it can actually improve our insulin sensitivity, reduce our inflammation. And I know that's a target for us definitely, which we're going to be targeting that high inflammation level. So then you see on the left here, things that can negatively affect the gut, like sugar, saturated fat, excess conventional meat. So non-organic red meat, chicken, turkey, 
um, artificial sweeteners, things like Splenda, aspartame, antibiotics. It's one of the biggest culprits that will damage the microbiome in the large intestine. And then things like PPIs and antacids because they're affecting our stomach acid. So we really want to keep that stomach acid optimized. And I know yours is on the lower side from the baking soda test and some of the other symptoms. So we'll be working to optimize that throughout the program. And these are just some factors that overall have a negative effect on the gut microbiome. Stress is a big one. We can definitely downplay the way stress affects our health, but it is has a huge effect on our microbiome, on our digestive checkpoints like stomach acid and motility, um, antibiotics and NSAIDs like ibuprofen and Advil. Those all negatively affect our gut health a low fiber diet. So if we're not feeding our, our bacteria and our gut, those healthy foods and fibers, we can see negative effects because we tend to displace them with more processed foods, um, more animal protein, things like that. And things like high and refined sugar, carbs, and preservatives and additives here on the right-hand side. We know that infections like overgrowth of candida or bacterial overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria, parasites, viruses, and instances of food poisoning, these can all affect the microbiome negatively. And we think for you that we have some pathogens going on, which we're going to assess from that microbiome stool test. We also know that BPA and plastics can also negatively affect the microbiome. We know from studies now that there's microplastics that basically damage the intestinal lining. So if you can definitely recommend switching to like glass or stainless steel, if you're not using those already, we know that birth control affects the microbiome. We don't need to worry about that. I know you said you're postmenopausal. So alcohol, we know damages the microbiome and then processed vegetable oils that are in a ton of processed foods, things like sunflower oil, canola, um, soybean oil, safflower oil. I don't typically recommend these, these oils in a lot of processed foods that people are getting in the supermarket. So definitely be on the lookout. I wouldn't say that you should avoid it because it's actually very hard to avoid them fully because they're in everything. But if you can get products with organic, you know, sunflower oil in them, definitely be avoiding canola as best you can. Definitely avoiding any hydrogenated oil because that's trans fats. So you just want to be on the lookout for these oils as an ingredient in products that you buy at the store. And gluten and dairy for some, they can also be um, inflammatory to the gut depending on each person. So we're going to kind of have a few phases throughout the program. So um, we basically want to have a start with a guided elimination diet. We'll talk about this in a few pages, but I'm recommending a lower FODMAP diet for you for a short period of time to kind of just get the inflammation and symptoms under control because they're affecting the constipation and bloating. So we also are going to allow the immune system to kind of suppress from a tightened state and provide symptom relief while we're addressing the root cause issues. So we are going to talk about some supplements that are going to help improve that microbial balance. And we're going to have use different supplements um, at different points of the journey. So I'll be encouraging you to get some supplements to support the dietary changes and facilitate the healing throughout the program. We'll also then, once we do the short-term elimination diet, we'll do like a short-term reintroduction period of some of the different groups of foods that we had short-term, um, that we had eliminated short-term. So we can expand your diet, um, basically getting it back to a fully balanced diet that's diverse, that has no limitations, you know, while being symptom-free. So that's the overall goal is to have a balanced eating plan and balance. We'll use my balanced meal formula, which we'll talk about to achieve long-term diet diversity without having symptoms, bloating, constipation, and feeling your best and being able to maintain a healthy weight. And I know that you said you wanted to lose five pounds, which is awesome. That's no problem. We'll definitely see that with inflammation reduction, um, but you are at a ideal body weight for your height. And I'll show you that. That's here. So you're 135 pounds. Your ideal body weight is 122 to 148. So again, you're within your ideal weight range, but totally five pound weight loss is doable for you. So large intestinal gut dysbiosis, I believe that is what's going on and contributing to your, your constipation um, and bloating and 
you know, all it's actually affecting a lot of these non-GI symptoms as well, like ADD, brain fog, joint pain. So we're going to really kind of look at that a lot deeper with that gut health stool test. So let me know when that comes and let me know when you submit that, because that's exciting for us to kind of get some more details about that. Um, so I'm going to be sending you um, a supplement that's going to help improve that dysbiosis, but we're not going to start it until after you submit that sample. We also know that there's sluggish motility going on due to the history of long-term hypothyroidism from Hashimoto's. It's awesome because it looks like your levels did improve. Those labs did improve and your T3, your T4 was all good. Let me just actually pull that up for you. So we see here your TSH was slightly high, but really okay for the fact that your T4, your T3 were all normal, your TPO antibodies were with all within normal limits. So that's looking really good. I think it just affected your motility and your motility never recovered. So hypothyroidism slows down the gut and it just looks like it never recovered from there. There could have been also a food poisoning event that could have contributed in the past. Like we've seen this before where it damages your migrating motor complex um, just by having, having basically a food poisoning event or gastroenteritis that you even may not have really known about, or maybe just thought you had like a minor stomach bug, but things like that can also damage the motility as well. So that could have played a role over time, you know, possibly that happened in addition to the Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. We also believe that there is leaky gut going on. We usually see this in conjunction with bacterial overgrowth and definitely with autoimmunity present in the body because that reduces the integrity of the gut lining. It allows food particles and bacteria and those negative bacterial metabolites, those L that LPSO is talking about. It allows all that to enter the bloodstream, which then raises systemic inflammation. So that contributes to those non-GI symptoms like I was talking about, like joint pain, rhinoids, not being able to focus or having good attention. So gut perme permeability, it's hard, it's a big word to say. Um, that will be a big target of our intervention in the program because we really want to make sure that gut lining has really good integrity and closes up if it's opened a little bit. And the chronic inflammation, we're really going to target as well. We know that there's chronic inflammation with Hashimoto's and history and the current rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis. So I do just recommend these certain inflammatory markers. Next time you go to the primary doctor, the sedimentation rate, the CRP and the homocysteine, because those are good indicators for inflammation in the body. Let me know too, how he diagnosed the rheumatoid arthritis, if it was like just a joint pain or if there was any blood work involved there too. We also know that there was lower stomach acid resulting in poor upper stomach digestion. Just take, take forms. Yeah, like you said, you had the upper stomach um, bloating and loose stools after a heavy meal, and you didn't have any burp in the baking soda test. So we want to make sure over the course of the program, we're improving your stomach acid. We're supporting that. So we'll talk about some ways so we can do that. Um, and I do have a whole lesson about stomach acid support. So we'll be watching that in the next few weeks. We also want to focus on the gut brain axis dysfunction because I believe there is the weakened vagus nerve going on. So the vagus nerve is something that it's a physical connection between the gut and the brain. It's a nerve that runs back and forth with the communication between the gut and the brain. So when that gets weak or it's untoned, that can lead to a sluggish gut as well. So we want to make sure that's well toned and it's working really well to improve that motility in the small and large intestine. I also think there's adrenal disease function going on due to all the chronic stressors on the body with the autoimmunity, dysbiosis, constipation. So we really want to focus on adrenal and mineral support. Um, and constipation in itself is a big stressor on the body because toxins and hormones that are meant to be excreted continue to be reabsorbed back into circulation. So adrenal support is going to be a big point for us as well. 
So what goals do we want to focus on? We want to make sure that even on the elimination plan, you're having a diverse range of food intake. So you have diverse fibers in your diet, different nuts and seeds and fruits, um, whole grains. We want to make sure that you're not eating the same few foods every day. And once you start posting, you know, in your food journal, I can get a good sense of this, of what you're eating now. Um, so we, especially, you know, during the elimination plan and as you expand off of it, we'll actually be doing a plant challenge throughout the program to see how many plants that you can eat in the week. And we want to see that increase over time. We also will work on rebalancing the gut microbiome and the large intestine through diet changes, the natural antimicrobials and targeted supplements we'll use together, certain probiotics that are helpful in improving the gut flora, lifestyle habits, stress reduction, meal spacing, and meal hygiene. We'll also work to optimize that stomach acid and optimize that motility through those prokinetics. There's dietary prokinetics as well, like ginger, which is amazing. So I also have a motility lesson that you'll be watching as well. Um, the vagus nerve support, which assists motility and stomach acid production. We'll work on reducing gut inflammation, reducing gut permeability permeability. I just see it's hard for me to say that word. And I say it all the time. Um, we want to also work on reducing the stress bucket overall in your lifestyle. You want to identify any toxin exposure you have in your home or the workplace. So think about this, you know, if there's anything that you think could be contributing to your chronic inflammation in your environment, um, definitely limiting your plastics, definitely not microwaving plastics that you're eating out of, using more glass and stainless steel, getting rid of nonstick pans, using more clean beauty and less toxic beauty and skincare. And I have a little bit more about this as well in my liver and gut health PowerPoint. Um, so we'll get into all this as well as you continue in the program. So your water intake goal would be about 90 ounces of water daily. It's about half your body weight in ounces plus more because you've been constipated. So we want to get things moving, help that hydration, um, improve the, that stool, you know, progression throughout the GI tract and minerals will help with that as well. So those LMNT packets, about a half in a serving will definitely be helpful for constipation, bloating, and energy because we really want those electrolytes like sodium, potassium to help load water into our cells to promote cellu cellular hydration. And it's also really good for constipation, especially with the magnesium added there, as well as the magnesium that you're taking at night. So we're also, I do recommend some uh, follow-ups with a GI doctor and I highlighted some of those um, labs that we want to look at with a primary doctor. Whenever you do have a new appointment, I know you kind of just had one in August, so maybe over the winter again, but this full iron panel would be good. Your hemoglobin A1C, maybe you know that and you can let me know. Um, your fasting insulin, what else? Your um, celiac disease markers. These are even something that you can do with your primary doctor. Um, and I would say you probably after that, you know, we'll see how you're doing. And if we need, feel that we need to order like a GI, have your primary doctor recommend a GI referral, we can do that. Or we can see how you're improving with our plan and you may not need it. I've seen that happen a lot where we heal things um, in the microbiome and that, you know, you really make, you're kind of ruling out other serious gut disease, but we can talk about that as the program progresses as well. But there is an elevated risk of celiac with Hashimoto's. So you could just have your primary doctor do those blood markers to screen for celiac. If you don't want to go, you know, straight to a GI doctor. So the low FODMAP diet, like I was saying before, is recommended for you for about five to six weeks or until we see significant relief in your symptoms. So the goal is not to have a super strict diet, but just to be able to reduce your symptoms enough so you feel a significant difference. So you make some swaps in your diet using the FODMAPs lists to basically make some better choices, like, you know, take some really high offenders out of your diet, let's say like garlic, onion, a lot of wheat, um, 
ripe bananas, a lot of avocado. There's some foods that are really high FODMAP that if we just swap with some simple swaps, we can see some reduction in symptoms and help you feel better. So I recommend if you can downloading the Spoonful app, which is free, the Monash app, is not free, but it's also really helpful for identifying FODMAP foods. I also have a low FODMAP video lesson and lots of PDF materials in your, in your program section. Um, then we have, um, definitely recommend more insoluble low FODMAP fiber to improve your constipation. So things like canned pumpkin, half a cup of gluten-free oats, ground flax seeds, chia seeds, sweet potato, hemp seeds, walnuts, almonds, pumpkin seeds, and sunflower seeds. All of these things are amazing for insoluble low FODMAP fiber intake to improve that stool bulk and help your food move through your GI tract, GI tract a little bit more quickly. We also recommend anti-inflammatory foods with high polyphenols and prebiotics like turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, basil, oregano, all those fresh herbs are really great for the microbiome, high percentage dark chocolate. There are many that are low FODMAP. So let me know if you have a question about that. And I could send you some screenshots as well from the Spoonful app. Um, we also love liver supporting and dandelion root. So I have a recipe for that in your um, document section because the dandelion root is really good for supporting the liver, especially if the gut is a little bit overloaded. We want to make sure that the liver has support because it's going to be working overtime to kind of get rid of those bacterial overgrowth. We do want to test this first with your um, your iron levels. So you can kind of disregard that for now about the increasing iron rich low FODMAP foods. Um, because we want to make sure, you know, we're going to test your levels first. Then ginger tea. Um, I love that between meals and an empty stomach to help stimulate your motility. We can also use fennel tea to help stimulate bowel movements. And I do have some different teas and recommendations on my Amazon low FODMAP list. So check that out as well in your document section. I do also have the golden turmeric latte, which is amazing for chronic inflammation that can help get that under control a little bit with the Hashimoto's history, the autoimmunity with the arthritis. So that golden turmeric latte in your document section will be great for helping, you know, get a hold on that chronic inflammation as we're going to be targeting stuff that's going on in the gut. So we want to be focusing on three regular meals daily using the balanced meal formula, which we'll talk about. We want to avoid skipping meals too. If you're bloated, this can tend to just make your bloating worse and it'll reduce your digestive capacity, reduce your stomach acid capabilities, reduce your pancreatic enzymes and bile output. So I don't typically recommend skipping meals when you're bloated. You want to just keep eating and doing your best with the, you know, making even like a low FODMAP choice that will help reduce your bloating going forward. And it's great that we have, if you have 12 to 14 hours about between dinner and breakfast and ideally not eating two to three hours before bed is great. So we don't let, allow food to sit in the small intestine overnight and ferment and chewing is really important as well. So we want to chew food very slowly and to applesauce consistency to kind of support your digestion and allow it to basically reduce the effort it needs to put into your digestion, right? So the smaller food particles we ingest, you know, the less work our GI tract has to do. And we'll, we'll kind of assess as well after low FODMAP to see if we need to keep you on, you know, any gluten-free plan. I have had good success with Hashimoto's and gluten-free, but if your TPO antibodies are pretty good, you may not need to make gluten choice, gluten-free choices going forward. So we'll play that by year um, and assess how you do with low FODMAP and the supplement changes. So I'll be sending you this Candida Remove. It's an antibacterial antifungal to help eradicate dysbiosis. Ig ignore the SIBO part. I don't think you have SIBO. I'm going to change that. Um, so we want to gradually increase the dosage. I'm also going to create a supplement plan. Um, but this is a great supplement because it basically does not kill the good bacteria. It only addresses bad bacteria in the gut. So it's very gentle. We do use it over a long period of time. So I may recommend that you order another bottle afterwards after I send you my um, one from me. So we will use that, you know, assess that on an individual basis. I do. And again, we want to, you know, wait for that. We'd want to wait to start using that until after you submit the sample for the stool test, because we don't want to 
you know, disrupt the um, results. So the next supplement I would recommend is if you're not wanting to do apple cider vinegar, which would be about two tablespoons and a glass of water in the morning, that would help stimu stimulate your stomach acid. That's a cheaper option. Or if you're not wanting to do that, or if it's burning, you can use digestive bitters, which I will recommend then on full script, which is my supplement dispensary. So digestive bitters and ACV are awesome for helping to stimulate that upper stomach digestion, help stimulate the stomach acid, bile, pancreatic enzymes. So we have really good optimal digestion in the top, you know, starting at the top down. You want to make sure that you're breaking down your food effectively and it's allowing that upper stomach digestion to really work its magic before everything gets to that motility, you know, that, that sluggish motility in the small and large intestine. And that herbal prokinetic is really doing great things. It sounds like already it's re-stimulating that migrating motor complex that was slowed down with the Hashimoto's. So that is called herbal prokinetic and it's ginger and artichoke extract. So it's all, um, you know, it's natural, it's herb based. There are medications that are prokinetics, but I prefer to use the herbal supplements. So we want to basically, we're using this to re-stimulate your migrating motor complex and the small intestine, re-stimulate that motility. So I'm glad that's already having a good effect. We also want to use a high quality multivitamin with minimum min uh, minerals to reduce inflammation, support a healthy thyroid. It has selenium. It has good zinc for gut healing. It has B vitamins for energy support. So really just helping to fill in the gaps in your diet. I definitely want you to continue that magnesium. The three caps before bed seems to be helping with those daily bowel movements. And that will then be temporary, right? We want to make sure that we're re-stimulating your motility so that you will not need magnesium in the future to go. Um, there's also Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a first phase probiotic I'd recommend for you to get. It's a yeast-based probiotic strain that helps improve dysbiosis in the large intestine. It helps improve gut permeability. It addresses bacterial overgrowth. It helps improve inflammation. So these are really important factors that it's called, it's in clinical practice it's called Floristore, but the strain of bacteria is called S. boulardii or Saccharomyces boulardii. So I love using this, especially in your case, because we're helping, we're basically using this probiotic to assist the antimicrobials. Then we have vitamin D and K2. Um, let me just check your labs again. So yep, vitamin D was low, 44. And even on some GI or regular doctor, primary doctor lab ranges, it will be, it will read as normal, but optimal is really 50 to 90. So I consider 44 low still. So I do recommend a vitamin D and K2 supplement for you. Um, I love this one by Thorn because it's drops that you can just drop into your water. It's no extra pills for the day. And I usually recommend pairing it with K2 like in this supplement because it doesn't pull calcium out of its storage in the bones to help absorb vitamin D. So it's really good way to get vitamin D while preserving your calcium status. And I'm sure that's something that you would be appreciative of being postmenopausal as well. So this is just going over the low FODMAP diet. They're showing how the FODMAPs will basically draw water into the intestine, increase gas production because those carbohydrates are malabsorbed in those suffering with IBS um, and dysbiosis. And dysbiosis is a cause of IBS. So we see that bloating, distension, gas, abdominal pain, constipation. So what we are aiming to do is reduce those fermentable carbs in the diet so you can get symptom reduction while we're addressing the root cause of dysbiosis and damaged motility. So we want to focus on low FODMAP swaps for the first two to six weeks. Definitely, I, I find that you need at least five to six weeks to see some improvements. Two is not really enough for, in my case, that I've seen to really reduce that inflammation. Then we want to, as we're you know taking some targeted supplementation, working on some lifestyle changes to improve motility and stomach acid, we'll then be reintroducing some FODMAPs in a structured way you know, in order to expand your diet again and to assess which 
FODMAPs you may still have a problem with or what you're really good with. And we only do this when you're feeling, you know, significantly better. So we want to make sure we get you to that point first. And then eventually our goal is that you are eating, you know, all different foods long-term. You're not on a restrictive diet anymore. You can handle all FODMAPs without any bloating or constipation. This is the balanced meal formula. So there will be a video lesson about this as well, but just as an overview, we recommend half of your plate, non-starchy vegetables, which we have below here. We have some different, um, just examples of this. And there's a whole low FODMAP PDF as well with, with basically recommended low FODMAP vegetables that are free portions. And then there are some vegetables that have a recommended portion size to remain low FODMAP. So I'll obviously help you with this in your journals as well. So then we have a quarter of the plate whole grains recommended or starchy vegetables, a quarter of the plate lean protein. So about three to four ounces of a lean meat, organic chicken, organic turkey, or you can use organic eggs. You can use tofu, um, tempeh. So there are a variety of different low FODMAP plant foods and proteins that you can use. And I do have a protein guide as well to help you with this. Then we want to add a dose of healthy fats, whether it's a quarter to an eighth of an avocado, a few tablespoons of olive oil or avocado oil, olives, almonds, you know, unprocessed almond butter, peanut butter, ghee, and grass-fed butter. These can all be a good healthy fat in your diet. Sorry, I literally hear screaming upstairs from my landlord's kids. So one second. I'm just moving my location. Okay. You can probably still hear it, so I apologize. <laughs> so these are some recommended whole grains and examples of some low FODMAP options. In addition to all the other modules that you have in your program in the Gucklow Reset program. Um, so I kind of expanded on each um, portion of the plate. I also get in, in depth here with snacks, having balanced snacks as needed throughout the day. So you want to make sure that you're not having carb only snacks. You're pairing carbs with protein and healthy fats in order to maintain proper blood sugar regulation. And I go into the, into this more depth in the balanced meal video lesson. And this is just a little bit about balancing your meal, especially at breakfast time, how this is the most important meal of the day in order to balance your blood sugar for the rest of the day. Make sure that you're not spiking your blood glucose in the morning and then it's crashing a few hours later, making you hungrier for carbs and sugar later in the day. So this is an example of a balanced breakfast. You have a low FODMAP breakfast ideas list as well. So this is eggs, greens, some sauerkraut, or probiotics would be awesome. Um, some berries, raspberries, low FODMAP. The only berries that are not low FODMAP are blackberries. So berries are an awesome snack breakfast that you can, you know, incorporate into your diet. A little avocado here for healthy fats. So this, you know, you could definitely add some sourdough toast or gluten-free toast. If you do wheat toast, I just recommend one piece of wheat toast a day because that is about the FODMAP threshold for wheat. So that's kind of an example of a balanced breakfast. And I'll provide you some with some more examples for that as well. This is just encouraging a little bit more about teas that I recommend. I have the turmeric tea at the back of the packet. I love green tea, dandelion root tea, especially that ginger tea for you to support motility on an empty stomach. Um, I love this grass-fed bone broth concentrate. You can add it to actually boiling water. Um, to soothe gut inflammation. This would be really good for you for systemic inflammation as well. And it has some minerals in it. It has some collagen and some different amino acids to improve that gut lining. So I definitely would recommend that for you. And it's on Amazon on my gut healthy Amazon list. I definitely recommend some kiwis for you. They have an enzyme called actinidin that helps stimulate bowel movements. A squatty potty would be great if you have not used one. Um, I definitely think for people with constipation, a squatty potty can be an awesome tool. I linked here my Amazon page and just some different recommendations. Um, stomach acid. So 
these are some signs that you may have low stomach acid. So the belching and bloating and more constipation, I would say, are more your, you know, triggers as well as like you said, the loose stools after a heavy meal. So we'll talk about this going forward. Just wanted you to be aware. We're going to start with the apple cider vinegar or the digestive bitters, depending on which one you want to try first. We'll be working on strengthening the vagus nerve and you'll be working on in your journals and in your everyday life over the next few weeks, just focusing on balance, three balanced meals a day, which helps support stomach acid. These are just examples of the high FODMAP foods sorted into groups. Basically all carbohydrate foods have these FODMAPs in them. So if they're, let's say an apple has the highest amount of fructose, so it's labeled under the fructose group. So all the, a lot of different FODMAP foods have a mixed range of FODMAPs. So you don't really need to worry too much about which food is in which group. We just want to make sure that, you know, we're kind of lowering the overall FODMAP load for you for the day and for the week in order to reduce symptoms and reduce inflammation. But when we do reintroduce them, we'll be kind of doing it in a structured way that represents a food will represent a FODMAP group. So let's say you didn't tolerate Blackberry still after a little bit, then we know that you may be have problem with the whole sorbitol group. So we'll kind of use that as an assessment tool. This is how to make a low FODMAP meal and building from the grains protein up. So I really like this little picture here of how to build that meal. And these are some examples of portion sizes on the FODMAP app. And don't really, you know, get too discouraged about this. Like you're not going to know all the different portion sizes of different foods. So I'll be helping you with this in your journal. You know, we can troubleshoot if you had bloating or constipation. I can assess your portion sizes a little bit more deeply for you because I'm more experienced in this. So you can check the Monish app if you're not sure. Um, but I don't really want it to create tons of food fears for you, right? So we want you to still be kind of eating a varied diet and making sure you're getting enough nutrition while also just keeping in mind the FODMAP groups and portion sizes. So if you wanted to look up almonds on the Monash app, one serving of almonds would be about 10 nuts low FODMAP. Um, and then blueberries, if you see here, they are high FODMAP at one cup, but they're low FODMAP at a one fourth of a cup throughout the day. So that again, that's something I can help you with in your journal. So you don't have to get too crazy about that ahead of time and trying to memorize everything, but you can refer to that Monash app, which is helpful. These are low FODMAP fruits in their portion sizes, which I always recommend pairing with a protein or healthy fat, like nut butter, almonds, um, maybe some grass-fed beef jerky. We always want to try to pair fruit or carbohydrates in general with a protein or healthy fat to promote that blood sugar stabilization, which is also really important for inflammation reduction. These are some foods that are high in fiber that are also low FODMAP. So I really would love to see a lot of these in your diet, quinoa, walnuts, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, brown rice, and a half a cup of canned chickpeas is low FODMAP. So if these are things that you have not had in a while, definitely recommend slowly increasing to build up your tolerance. We don't want you going from zero to a hundred and then you, you know, you're super bloated and constipated because you had too many chia seeds or too many pumpkin seeds or chickpeas in a day. These are some more ways to spice up your meals on low FODMAP without garlic and onion, because those are the two highest FODMAP seasonings, I would say. So there's a lot of different ways that you can provide flavoring and definitely check out the recipes in your low FODMAP document section to support this. Here's an example of a low FODMAP Buddha bowl. Love lunches like this or quick dinners like this. And here's just some more ways to optimize your fiber, ways to volumize your veggies, um, you know, chopping your vegetables when you get home from the grocery store to make it easier to then like throw into a stir fry later. You can buy pre-chopped vegetables to make your life easier. You don't always have to do everything from scratch. I'm definitely a big proponent of buying like pre-bagged salads or pre-chopped broccoli, pre-chopped butternut squash. I love all that because it's a time saver and it's going to help you make healthy, quick choices in the moment. A little bit more about sugar. Here's some healthy low FODMAP snack options. So definitely recommend checking this out. And I have links to some of my favorite bars and crackers. 
I have a smoothie recipe, definitely get some good old hard boiled eggs and some fruit is a great option. Some dark chocolate with some fruit for an evening snack, a little bit of avocado on sourdough gluten-free toast with a little egg on top. Love some things like that. So let me know if you need any more ideas for snacks. And then we just have a weekly meal prep guide, some things that you can do ahead of time to make your life easier, like making some quinoa ahead of time, or again, like buying some of those prepackaged quinoa or brown rice packets with nothing else in them. That's where you also kind of watch, want to watch for hidden garlic and onion with the FODMAPs because they kind of sneak those into everything. Um, and then the, there's roasted lemon green beans. Then we have maple Dijon salad dressing. So these are just some things that you could do ahead of time to make your life easier and to make, you know, better choices on little FODMAP. Roasted sweet potatoes. And then just some other things to keep on hand like some sauces, some seasonings. I really like that Fadi Foods brand. I really love Primal Kitchen. They have avocado oil mayo. They have a Greek dressing that's no garlic. And those are also in my low FODMAP um, Amazon list. Here's a fresh turmeric tea, which is amazing for inflammation. In addition to that bone broth concentrate, definitely recommend you getting that as well. Here's some bone broth if you want to make it homemade, if you want to be, you know, totally ambitious. I love to see this. Let me know if you try it. Um, but low fat organic bone broth is an amazing way to help support that gut lining and reduce inflammation in the gut. And the key here is using the lemon juice or ACV because that extracts the collagen from the bones. Here's some almond butter and strawberry oatmeal with a little bit of added protein. We want to make sure that if you are having like a high carb breakfast, like oatmeal, you are balancing out with a little bit of protein via collagen, almond butter, or hemp seeds or chia seeds. Or you can use another well-tolerated protein powder. If you have one that you use already, you can definitely send it to me for a review and we can see if it's going to be, you know, if it's going to work into your plan. And then we have a smoothie and I have a lot of other smoothie recipes in your document section. So check that out. We want to make sure your, your smoothies are balanced and they're going to keep you full for a few hours. We don't really want you to have a smoothie that's full of fruit and sugar and juice. That's going to only keep you full for like 30 minutes. And you can also, if you find that you're not, you know, super satisfied with just a smoothie, you could always do smoothie and a little avocado toast as well. So yeah, let me know if you have any other questions as you're going through the packet, you know, as you're going through the materials, uh, you know, you have this whole week to chat, answer questions. Um, we didn't really start Monday, so we can definitely do like full seven days from Tuesday on, which is no problem. And then next week will be our first group zoom on Wednesday. So again, um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions as you're reviewing this, head to your roadmap. And after watching this, you can definitely watch also the balanced meal PowerPoint lesson, which is in your program modules. And it's also linked in your roadmap. And don't forget to join the Facebook group. All right, Jamie, I will talk to you soon. Oh my God, did I not record that?